Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Joshi, one of the instructors of the course Medical Education in the New Millennium. And this is our third course today that we have, bringing the patient voice to medical education. I'm excited to announce that we have two Ignite speakers today. The first one is Anna Clemson. She's currently completing her nursing degree at Dirk Duke University. She has been involved with Medicine X since its inception in 2011 and currently serves as a member of the Medicine X Student Leadership Program. We also have Ryan Pryor, who is a journalist and nonprofit director interested in the intersection of complex disease, molecular medicine, and bioinformatics. Ryan's special interest is in severe neuroimmune conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome, which he had contracted in 2006. He's writing on healthcare, has appeared in USA Today and in the Daily Beast, and he is currently directing a feature length documentary titled The Forgotten Plague. But first, we'll have a short message and then resume. Welcome to Medical Education in the New Millennium, a new course from the Stanford University School of Medicine. This interdisciplinary course is produced by Stanford Medicine X and features talks from thought leaders and innovators from medical education, instructional design, cognitive science, online learning, and emerging technology. Over the course of 11 weeks, we'll consider how to build educational experiences that address the unique learning preferences of today's millennial medical students and residents, address gaps in the current medical education system, and explore what might be accomplished when all healthcare stakeholders are included in the conversation. If you are joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there is a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. Christopher Snyder, otherwise known as I am Spartacus, is the in-class moderator for today's program and will be taking questions from social media. So please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speakers. Please also make sure to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX. Please note, you are watching a live online program and there is a delay between real-time events and the live stream you are watching. Tweets from our in-class guests will appear before you see the real-time events they are tweeting about unfold on the video live stream. Okay. Hi, my name is Anna Clemenson. I'm currently a nursing student at the Duke University School of Nursing and I'm going to tell you a story today about hearing voices. So a part of our mental health course is we did this simulation called um, uh, Hearing Distressing Voices. So we're all told to report to the nursing school sim center in our scrubs with a pair of headphones and no one's quite sure what's going to happen. So we get there and we're told you're each going to get a little um, audio file on a player and you're going to stick in your headphones and we're going to have you rotate through some stations and do some tasks all while hearing distressing voices and this is meant to simulate uh, what, a patient with a, what a patient who has schizophrenia uh, goes through. So we put our headphones on, and I go to the first station. And so the first station is kind of this throwback, and we're told to sit down. We have this bucket of beads and these little patterns here. And we're told, you know, here's a picture of a pattern, and we want you to recreate it. And so I put my headphones on. I say, okay, we're going to go do this. And the headphones come on, and the first thing I hear is some Mot like kind of Motown music. And we all kind of look at each other and laugh a little bit, because we're not quite sure what to expect. And I kind of think to myself, you know what, I listen to music when I study. It's maybe not going to be so different, we'll see. And then I start to hear voices. I start to hear voices that are angry, voices that are aggressive, voices that are paranoid, voices that are upset. They're coming in my left ear, in my right ear. Sometimes multiple ones are talking at once. Sometimes it's just one at a time. Um, and they're angry. Some of them are swearing at you. Some of them are telling uh, just horrible things to you. There's one lady who I end up looking for the entire time. And I hear her voice in my ear, and she's telling me that it's going to be OK. And throughout the entire simulation, she was that kind of island of peace through all this kind of going on. And I start to think to myself, it's going to be a lot harder than I think. So I'm going through the little pattern that I have. It's a pattern of a flower. And I start you know, building the beads in. 
And then the proctors come around. And this is when I realized this is not just an internal simulation, it's an external one as well. Because the proctors come around and they dump all my beads out on the table and they tell me I'm doing it wrong to start over. And they do that to everyone. And it starts to feel very frustrating because I feel very isolated. Um, I don't know what's going on and I feel out of control. However, the most impactful part of the simulation is we had to do kind of a mock ER visit. So we go to the station and I have an ER intake form and I kind of fill out why I'm here and all these things and then I get called in and I sit down to talk to an ER nurse practitioner and she starts going through this form with me. And she starts asking me questions and it starts to get even harder because half my attention is now on these voices that I keep hearing all around and half my attention is trying to talk to her but also trying to make it seem like I'm not hearing other things. And then she starts asking me questions like, I'm going to have you start at 100 and count backwards uh, with serial 7. And that was very hard because it's it tough to concentrate but also pay attention to what was happening. But the hardest thing and probably the most, most impactful part of this experience is when she said, I'm going to tell you an abstract phrase and I want you to describe to me what that means. And so she goes, tell me what it means when I say a rolling stone gathers no moss. This is hard enough already <laughs> to describe, but it's even harder. And I will always remember that as I open my mouth to try and tell her about it, the angry voice, the one, the guy who's really upset, he's swearing at you, he's telling you awful things, he starts yelling on my left side. And instinctually, I turn to the left because that's kind of what we do when we hear someone talk to us, we turn. And in that moment, I start to panic because I know what this looks like to this lady that I'm talking to, that I'm turning and I'm not paying attention and she's just waiting for my response. And again, I start to feel that panic and I say, well, I can't tell her that I'm hearing these voices. She's going to think I'm, I'm crazy. You know, she's clearly not hearing them like I am and kind of what do I do? And there's that kind of loss of, of where do I go from here? And so that was the end of the simulation. And we talked about it, and it was created by this lady named Pat Deegan. She's a clinical psychologist, but she was also dis, uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia when she was a teenager. And part of her advocacy work was to develop this simulation so that um, people who worked in healthcare or other people by proxy could understand what is it like for someone who actually, you know, hears voices so you can experience too. And I thought this was, you know, when learning upon the topic for today, I thought this was an excellent way to talk about bringing the patient voice into education. Because I think in the end, what it taught us was how to empathize. Because, you know, in class we talk about this is how someone, you know, we, we talk about if a patient has schizophrenia, this is how they'll present. These are the symptoms that they'll have. But the simulation enabled us to feel the feelings that people would have, you know, for that brief period of time in relation to those symptoms. So I think that this is really the value of bringing the patient voice into medical education because the patient experience in their own conditions is invaluable. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Ryan Pryor. I'm a writer and a, and a patient. I'm a writer and a patient and turned into a filmmaker and an activist. My story begins October 22nd, 2006. I came home from high school when I fell asleep and slept for 16 hours straight. I did it again and again and again. Soon, I had to drop out of high school completely. It took six months to find a diagnosis and I saw 16 doctors. And meanwhile, I couldn't participate in any of the normal high school activities. The diagnosis was chronic fatigue syndrome. Worldwide, the disease is called myalgic encephalomyelitis, which means a painful inflammation of the brain and the nervous system. Many doctors are not taught about it in medical school, and many doctors don't even believe it exists. But I'm here to tell you it exists, and it's very, very nasty. High levels of viral activation, low levels of natural killer cells, and very severe um, abnormalities throughout all the patients. But it's very difficult to find a doctor who understands how to diagnose it, and very difficult to find someone who can treat it. I'm one of the few who's lucky enough to have found a doctor and who, who had a family who could support paying for treatments that weren't covered by insurance. And when those treatments actually worked for me. 
as much as I can praise my doctor and my family, however, my presence here on this stage today is, could just be dumb luck. No one really knows why some people with MECFS improve. Some estimates say the recovery rate is 5 to 10 percent, and some patients I know believe that I'm in that 5 or 10 percent. Um, but we, we really don't know. And I don't always feel like I'm recovered because I take 20 pills a day, I take, give myself a shot once a week, and I give myself an IV treatment every month. Um, so I shared, I was writing for USA Today, and I shared my story in an op-ed. I had no intention to become an advocate, but something pulled at me to tell, me, tell a story that no one else I thought could tell. The response to that story changed my life. It went viral. People were writing in the comment box on the USA Today article talking about how they were committing, thinking about committing suicide because the disease was so severe. The pain was horrible, but the lack of recognition from society was even worse. So I had one foot in the world of the healthy, and I had one foot tapping very, very impatiently in the world of the sick. And if treatments don't improve, I'm sad to say that I, I'll never uh, have a cure, let alone most other patients. So I, should, um, so I started, you know, uh, started the documentary project called Forgotten Plague. The story has never really been about me. It's been about the people who are housebound. It's been about the people who are bedbound, about the people who can no longer eat solid food. It's about the people who can't live their lives in complete darkness, but they can't, they can't tolerate even the smallest amount of light. It's about the people who have lost their ability to speak. People with my disease sometimes lose their ability to speak entirely, but I've had my voice magnified by the, by the megaphone of national media, and I think that society, that we need to do more. This is a patient named Whitney Defoe. He lives in Palo Alto, about a mile from here. His, his, his father is Ron Davis, a professor of medicine, or in genetics here at Stanford, and is one of the people that helped create the Human Genome Project. He, they have access to some of the best doctors in the world who, who treat uh, MECFS here at Stanford. But Whitney has lived the last year and a half. He hasn't spoken a word in the last year and a half. He hasn't left this room in the last year and a half. And we learned recently that he would have to receive uh, all of his nutrients only through an IV port in his uh, arm like that. Stories like Whitney's are the ones that matter most. And this is why I believe this is one of the great underreported medical stories of our time. It's inexcusable that disease can be so severe, and yet 1 million Americans have it, and 20 million people worldwide suffer from it and the NIH only supports $5 million a year in research. We have to change that. So we're going to start, we're doing a down payment to, to start changing that. This is the, um, our film will debut in two weeks at the Chinese Theater in Hollywood. This is the same theater where Star Wars and Wizard of Oz also uh, debuted. The, the, pro, the, the film, the, the debut will mark the beginning of the end MECFS project, which will be led by Whitney's father, Ron Davis. It features two Nobel laureates on its um, scientific advisory board. Uh, one of those is Jim Watson, who won the Nobel for discovering the structure of DNA. So how does this relate to medical education in the new millennium? Our film will be a mainstream release, but will also be used as, as a tool to educate doctors about this disease. William Osler was often is one of the great um, scholars of medical education, and he talks about the, the incredible importance of just listening to patients. The same was true of the book Oser's Web, which is the, the most famous uh, book written about chronic fatigue syndrome, which also suggests that much of the problem is that doctors just aren't quite listening closely enough. And so in today's revolution in digital media enables us to do something quite similar. Uh, it allows these the voices to be heard. So doctors need to listen more closely, but even more importantly, patients for the first time have the tools for their voice to be heard. Thanks. Okay. And then introduce. Okay. And um, Kirsten first. Okay. okay. So uh, Kirsten Auster is a media scholar and design thinker who specializes in health and medical visualizations. She's a professor of English at Rice University and recently completed a master of public health degree at the University of Texas. Dr. Aster is especially interested in using new media technologies to enhance patient-centered care and is the director and co-founder of the Medical Futures Lab, a collaborative center dedicated to reimagining medicine at the intersection of humanity and technology. 
Brian Vardabedian is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and an attending physician at Texas Children's Hospital, America's largest children's hospital. He is a graduate of the University of Massachusetts Medical School and completed his residency in pediatrics and fellowship at Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine. Brian Vardabedian is the author of the 33 Charts blog and is also a co-founder of the Medical Futures Lab. We'll hear, we'll hear from Brian and Kirsten after a brief message from Medicine X. In 2015, Medicine X will be launching a new program called Medicine X Ed. This special conference, right before Medicine X 2015, will focus on medical education and what might be accomplished when all healthcare stakeholders can engage in a conversation about changing the culture of medicine through educational innovation. Of course, we'll discuss the role technology can play in medical education, but we'll also look at gaps in our current educational system, such as participatory medicine, shared decision-making, patient engagement, cost transparency, patient safety and reducing harm, and cross-cultural competencies. What other gaps might we address at MedicineX Ed? Let us know what you think by tweeting our hashtag MedEx. And make sure to sign up online to learn more about MedicineX Ed and how you can get involved. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Vardabi. I'm from Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and I'm really excited to be here this evening. I want to thank uh, Dr. Larry Chu for inviting us to uh, come and be part of this exciting course. Kirsten and I are excited to be talking about the patient voice. Um, this is really an amazing time to be in medicine. Uh, those medical students from the audience here, you guys are really in for a, an amazing ride for the years ahead. Uh, one of the challenges we're facing, though, is despite all the advances that we're currently seeing in medicine, medical education has uh, yet to catch up. Um, so this evening, um, what we'd like to do is uh, talk about three things here. We want to cover initially why we want to talk about e-patients in, in medicine and in medical education. Why, why would we want to do that? Uh, we're going to cover a creative approach to bring the patient voice to medical education. Then we're going to finish up with a couple of uh, strategic angles to changing minds in the medical education system. Uh, this question of um, bringing the e-patient into the uh, uh, the question of bringing the e-patient into uh, medical education is kind of an interesting question. When Dr. Chu presented it to us, I thought this is kind of a crazy question because isn't the patient voice already part of medical education, or shouldn't be? Shouldn't it be part of medical education already? Um, and why would we need to discuss this? And um, in reality, we're really not doing this, and it's really not a crazy question. When you look a little bit deeper, we see that this question actually has a really pretty deep historical context. Um, it tells us a lot about where we've come from and the relationship we've had with patients in the past and where we're evolving. Um, and so I thought it might be helpful just to talk a little bit about how the e-patient got to where they are today, and what were the social and technological forces that contributed to uh, the empowered patient that we all deal with and encounter today. And so it's, uh, it's important because for the better part of history, when patients came to the doctor, they basically did what they were told, right? You came in, you saw the doctor, the doctor prescribed treatment, and uh, that was pretty much it. You did as you were, you were told. You had no access to any other information, and we all hoped that the one doctor that we were seeing uh, was giving us the right information. But something happened on the way to the clinic, of course, and the internet appeared, right, in the, in the 90s, and patients got immediate access to information, um, stuff that had only been restricted to doctors at one point. Now, patients had access to it. Initially, it was read-only, Web 1.0. We could only see stuff, uh, but as, um, as the web evolved, uh, we were able to talk back and actually create content and participate in conversations that were happening around content that was being created. Uh, then, of course, in the 2000s, we saw the fact that patients could now come together. They could uh, organize in, through social networks. And this became a, a critical issue because instead of uh, 
looking to the internet to find information, uh, patients were then getting information coming to them through their social networks. So this represented a, a huge change. Um, and so uh, this force of access to information became, uh, became a real critical issue in seeing the evolution of the e-patient. Um, so I had a patient who came in um, not long ago uh, with ulcerative colitis. And it was a little eight-year-old boy, and he had an unfortunate complication of his ulcerative colitis called sclerosing cholangitis. And this is a condition where the ducts that lead out of the liver uh, are prone to autoimmune activity, become fibrosed, and it can often lead to chronic liver disease. And so I was following this patient. At the end of this particular visit, mom pulled, in, pulled out of her bag a, a paper about uh, an antibiotic that was experimental and was being used to um, treat sclerosis and cholangitis. And I looked at the paper, and uh, I immediately saw it was from the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology Nutrition. And it was um, a paper that was actually sitting on my desk in, I'm sorry, in a, um, on, a, on a pile just like this. And so it was, it, was, it was there, but I hadn't quite had the time to get to it. Um, and so this brief encounter actually went on to treat the patient with that medication. The study was actually done right here at Stanford, as fate would have it, uh, and the patient actually uh, did well. Um, but it's a great example of how um, the relationship between doctors and patients is changing due to this access to information. A few upshots we can take from this uh, little encounter that kind of um, illustrate how things have changed. Um, first off, that Patients no longer control information. Uh, secondly, there is uh, certainly too much to know. Uh, we're reaching the point in uh, medicine where it's really, we're really unable to keep up with all that's happening. And for those medical students that are here in the audience, you represent the first generation really that are going to be uh, accessing information as opposed to learning and memorizing information the way most physicians have done throughout most of history. So it's a real change. Um, and finally, um, I'm sorry, healthcare is, uh, healthcare is collaborative. Sorry, I'll get that. So, um, so as we can see here, there's been a real shift in, in the relationship that doctors and patients uh, share. We had uh, the paternalistic relationship that we were so used to for hundreds of years, and uh, that has actually been uh, changed to a relationship that is more egalitarian and more patient-centered. Beyond that, we actually have a new player, uh, which we've talked about, which is, which is the information that, uh, I'm sorry, which is the information that patients bring to, bring to us when they come and visit us in the exam room. So uh, beyond just the relationship that we have with our patients, uh, our patients are also having a relationship with their information, and it's a relationship that we need to respect and understand, and uh, the way we train our physicians going forward really has to respect that uh, evolving relationship between, between patients and their information. So um, there is, this is a, a, a tweet that was captured during Medicine X a couple of years ago. Uh, the, the fatal assumption is that patients want to know only what doctors want to explain. And the e-patient says no more. So again, we were at one point really restricted by everything that one doctor knew. And this really represents a remarkable change. And so the encounter that patients have with me when they come to visit me um, is evolving and emerging as, a, as a less of a key role in that patient getting better. Okay, patients have more, more access to different resources. It's funny, one of my, some of my colleagues, when they are skeptical about going on to uh, using social media and public platforms, they're often afraid they're gonna get inundated with questions from, uh, from patients, but I always break it to them that patients have access to other sources of information besides them. It's no longer about you, right? Um, so I'm sorry, I'm going to see if I can get this to go. So are medical students trained, we can ask the questions, are medical students being trained to work and function in this new environment that we've been talking about? And the answer is probably not. Um, we have a long way to go in terms of uh, introducing our future physicians to the emerging culture of the e-patient and participatory medicine. Um, like I said at the outset, medicine is advancing at a, um, a rate that we can't keep up, and 
most of our medical schools are operating at an institutional, 20th century institutional rate. And so um, it's really hard to design a curriculum when things are changing so quickly. Um, but this is a picture actually of William Osler, a picture there on the, on the bottom from Johns Hopkins in the uh, early part of the century. Uh, but medicine at that time uh, was taught much like it is today. And uh, there are a lot of things that still need to change. So why has medical education been slow to integrate the patient, uh, or the patient voice rather, into medical education? And we can all discuss this in the time that we have uh, for a discussion afterwards. But um, I think many of us as medical educators and as physicians, we live and operate in silos. Again, bringing back to my experience of doctors who get onto public platforms, they really like to engage with other doctors. I think this is a huge mistake because I think a lot of the uh, solutions to the problems that we face as uh, physicians and in healthcare uh, as, a, as a whole exist outside the silo of medicine. I think we really need to bust those silos, much like we see happening here at Medicine X. Um, traditionally, um, medicine has been disease centric. The first two years of medical school, students spend a lot of time really focused on specific disease processes that sort of ignore the specific needs of the patient. Uh, once they get into uh, the clinical years, things tend to be more clinically and doctor-centric. Um, innovation has been challenged by regulation. Okay? Um, even if a medical school really wanted to have an innovative curriculum that integrated the patient voice, there are real restrictions by uh, regulatory bodies to teach students in a certain way. And so that represents a real challenge for people who want to innovate. And of course, uh, in all fairness to, to our medical schools, the e-patient movement is really a relatively new phenomenon. In the scheme of history, this is all uh, very, very recent. So um, with that, I just wanted to um, finish up this segment by um, showing you how our, when I think about our, our patients in the, in the whole scheme of Health 2.0, um, our patients are really the leaders. They're the ones who were participating very early on. The physicians follow behind them, and certainly behind the physicians are uh, our medical schools and the institutional pace of our medical schools. I'll pass this along to Kirsten. All right. That's a push hard. Thanks, Brian. So I'm Kirsten Oster. Here we go. And, whoop, oh, go back. I get it now, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so what I want to do is given the context that Brian just laid out in terms of thinking about why patients haven't really been an active part of medical education up until now and thinking about how we might change that moving forward and why we need to change that, I want to just start by really laying out briefly some spaces where patients can intervene, can engage in medical education, some ways that doctors can really draw patients into medical education, draw their voices in, and then go through a kind of creative strategy for doing that, of which there are many, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk you through one. So uh, just for example, in terms of bringing the patient voice into medical education, patients can help identify gaps in the curriculum and help fill those gaps by helping us think through how to do so, helping us redesign the curriculum. Patients can visit courses like they're doing here, teach the courses even, design teaching materials for courses, um, engage in social dialogue around medical education, which they're already doing as well, um, participate in student assessment and evaluation even. So this is just a sampling of the, of the kinds of ways that patients' voices could get into medical education. And so then, oh, go back. So then thinking about the flip side of that, there's also the question of who currently usually runs medical education, and it's usually doctors. So what can doctors do to help bring the patient's voice into medical education? First, I think it's really critical to actually recognize why that's an important thing to do. So one, patients are experts, as you've already heard today, and I think you've heard numerous times in this class. E-patients often say nothing about us without us, and I think that really captures the sense that patients have a certain unique kind of expertise that is irreplaceable and that is incredibly valuable and powerful and, and needs to be heard in the context of medical training. Um, 
we also know from research that engaged patients have better health outcomes and doctors want that for their patients, so it's another reason to be involved, to get patients involved. Once we establish those basic premises, then we need to think about other ways that doctors can actively engage patients in medical education. Okay, such as seeking out e-patients, connecting patients with each other, here we go, asking questions of patients, and really moving from being inside of a silo to reaching out from beyond that silo. Of course, we can also leverage existing tools. So I wanted to put this up here. This is a tweet from just last week by one of our former students, Amal Trankar, who's now in his first year of medical school at Vanderbilt. And he commented that in his pathophysiology lectures, um, when he goes on Twitter and searches for patients who are talking about having the different diseases that he's learning about in these classes, it really humanizes the content. Now this is, a, this is a perfect example of leveraging existing tools because those voices are all already out there and any medical student, any doctor, any student of any kind of health profession or anything can go on and do what he just did. So it's a really great example of an easy way to get patient voices more into the dialogue in a way that is not um, done that much yet and that really needs to be done more. Okay, another thing we can do is get creative in our practices. And this is where I'm going to go into an example for you. Um, I want to suggest that we can use something called transmedia storytelling to bridge the gaps in doctor-patient communication. In many ways, when you think about why the patient's voice isn't in medical education, what you're asking about is a communication problem. Why is there what seems to be traditionally a one-way uh, monologue when there really should be a two-way dialogue? So this is a communication problem. So what can we do to start addressing this problem? OK. So transmedia storytelling is telling a story across multiple platforms, such as those listed here, novel, movie, website, game. This is something that Hollywood does. If you picture any of the latest blockbusters, Batman, Spider-Man, these kinds of movies, you can see how you know, they have toys, they have action figures, they have games. They have websites and all these other things. So on a very basic level, it's telling a story across multiple platforms. So why would this be useful in healthcare and in bringing the patient voice into healthcare? OK, well, it's really good for telling complex narratives. With multiple storylines, OK? It's really good for stories with large casts of characters, and it's really good for stories with numerous settings. So if you picture a story that develops across all of these different platforms, one of the things that those stories do is they develop different parts of the story, different characters, different settings in these different domains. This is very much like what you hear many e-patients with chronic diseases talking about. Their lives are full of very complex storylines. There there's a huge cast of characters including their doctors, other kinds of healthcare providers, their caregivers, their family members, all these other people. It takes place in numerous settings and it's all totally disjointed. And what people really want is to pull all of those strands of their, of their lives and their experience together. So, okay. So how can transmedia storytelling help us bring the patient voice into medical education? One of the things that doing this across multiple platforms can do is capture a 24-7 kind of 360 degree experience. So you actually bring together the different parts of a patient's experience. It can help you translate data into words and images and sounds so that a patient doesn't feel like they're only their lab values. It can help you engage in imaginary world building so that you can relate to the experience that patients are having. And it can help offer a kind of multi-dimensional framework for hearing the patient's point of view. So let's see what this might look like. OK. First step, you have to identify a, a gap in doctor-patient relations. 
doctor-patient communication, okay? So I, as an example, I want to just mention something that came up in the first class here when Britt Johnson came, and she mentioned how her doctor often doesn't know what her pain feels like. So how to start addressing this? One thing I want to suggest is that we can do things with words. So you mentioned analogy earlier. Words are a good way to help understand how, what someone else means by actually playing with words and understanding with them what, what they're talking about when you hear them say something. So this is, this is sort of like a series of exercises you can do in educational settings, all different kinds of educational settings. But here the hypothetical is, say, um, in medical education. And ideally, this would happen between students and patients. So a metaphor, everyone remembers metaphors, using one thing to mean another. My pain is a battle. My pain is a dance. My pain is a cactus. My pain is a tidal wave. Those, those kinds of metaphors, they, they give you a sense of what that person is experiencing that is very different from how, what's your pain on a scale from 1 to 10. OK, simile, it's like a metaphor, but it compares two things using like or as. I can't resist because this is my favorite simile. Getting a mammogram is like ha making a panini with your breast, which is true. Um, and it also really evokes what that might be like. Um, and an analogy, these are both analogies, metaphor and simile. And, and analogies can be just uh, more extended comparisons that kind of imply a logical argument. So often we talk about the human body as a machine, and it implies all kinds of things about the different, how di the different parts of it work in relation to each other. And analogies can be visual as well. OK, so some exercises that you can do with that, I'll just let that one go, is you can think about, um, you, you think about the problem, the communication problem you started with. You know, my doctor doesn't understand my pain. Come up with 10 metaphors. My pain is, come up with 10 of them and do that with similes too. My pain is like, just as a way to start building up ideas for what the, this process might look like in terms of using language to share understanding. Another step, doing things with point of view. That's what POV stands for, point of view. How does a story change when it's told by different narrators? So if you tell a story in the first person, you use I. I am experiencing joint pain. I feel this way. I feel that way. When you tell a story in the second person, you use you. You need to decrease your medications. You might want to move more. You um, might not be getting enough sleep. In the third person, you have he, she, it, the. The patient complained of shortness of breath. The, breath, the patient did this. The patient did that. So you can tell the same story from all three points of view, and you get a really different sense of what is actually going on in that experience when you do so. So an exercise that you can do with this is you can um, have a specific communication problem that you, that you have identified, like my doctor doesn't understand my pain, and describe that from all three points of view. First, tell it in the first person I as the patient or perhaps a caregiver. Then tell it in the second person as the healthcare provider. And finally, tell it in the third person as a case report in that very distance objective language. And see what gets lost and see what gets added from these different perspectives. OK, so final step, doing things with pictures, starting to kind of visualize all of this. Now, Let's think about how visual representation of a problem really changes our way of understanding it. You might ask yourself, what does the problem look like? What are its most salient features? What is its setting? If you were going to make it into a movie, what would be, you know, what would be in the scene? What would be the props? What would be the costumes? What would be the lighting? You can think about health problems like that as a way of getting a sense of what that experience is like. OK. So the way that you can actually do an exercise with this is through storyboarding, which is what people do when they're making a movie or any, any number of kind of creative practices. And you can do, I want to emphasize, you can do all of this stuff digitally using tools that we have now, but you can also do it analog. And it's important, of course, when bringing a patient, the patient's voice in to remember <laughs> that not all patients' voices are really engaged with or that interested in beginning to engage with digital media. If you think about the aging population, you know, they may be much happier drawing things and writing in paper, and that's totally fine. You can do all of this stuff both ways. But sketch out what the problem is in pictures with captions. Maybe it's a day in the life of. And draw what that looks like. Or you could do the same thing using tool, digital tools we have, photos, tweets, pins, video, and make it a storify. It's, you know, this, is, this is a tool that we have. 
So when you do all of these practices together, to go back to this question of how bringing the patient voice into medical education is a communication problem, you can think about the kinds of skills that you are cultivating by doing this. Hearing nuances of language, using metaphor and simile and analogy, cultivates listening skills, which is a critical skill in communication, right? And you have to be able to hear the patient's voice. If the patient's voice gets into medical school but no one's listening, then it's not going to make a difference. You, the ability to shift point of view is critical for empathy. You have to be able to have an understanding of what someone else is going through to empathize with them, which is a critical skill in doctoring. And then seeing the problem in the daily life context through storyboarding really helps with the overall process of understanding through narrative what someone is going through, which is a core feature of communication. So I want to just suggest that if we cultivate these skills in educational settings, in medicine and healthcare more broadly, we can then provide future doctors with the tools to really engage the patient voice on a whole new level and continue to refine those skills as they move forward into their clinical practice. So I'll hand it off to Dr. V to wrap it up. Yeah. All right. So um, Eric Schmidt, who's the CEO of Google, uh, suggested recently in his latest book that with greater connectivity will come greater expectations. But we can extrapolate that by saying that with greater uh, patient connectivity comes greater expectations from their physicians. So uh, we really have to do a better job uh, in medical education preparing our students for this next generation of connected patient uh, because they are going to expect it or if not demand it. Um, so what can we do? Um, you know, we opened up by talking a little bit about um, some of the roadblocks that uh, we face in medical school. Uh, curricula, uh, curricula that are tight, uh, regulatory bodies, um, attitudes and things. Uh, there are some things that we can do. Uh, one is um, we can consider um, grassroots education. And one of the things that we often face in medical education is getting having a hard time getting into the curriculum. All the curriculum deans at these schools are very, very uh, constrained with all the new uh, uh, guidelines and requirements that these medical students have to have. Um, so uh, providing education uh, regarding the patient voice can happen during brown bag lunches. Grand rounds are a great opportunity for uh, like-minded people to get together and give these kinds of presentations. Um, Educator network, okay, we need to be educating our educators. Um, remember I mentioned that we tend to, as doctors, live in something of a silo, right? We like to listen to our own, our own people, right? It's a natural thing, we all do that. Um, so we need to kind of get inside the system, and talk to our educators and see if we can integrate some of this thinking and the culture and sensibilities of the e-patient into the training and education process. Um, establishing a national presence is important. Now, there's been a recent move to get e-patients uh, involved in national medical meetings, and it's starting to take hold. The uh, Association of Medical, American Medical Colleges, which is meeting next month in Chicago, um, has a couple of panels with e-patients who are representing the patient voice. What a great place for us to get some leverage with all the deans and medical educators in the United States. Um, and so we can all play a role in uh, getting patients involved in these national meetings in a meaningful way. And then finally, uh, it is critical for us as uh, uh, schools and uh, institutions to have uh, a local network of e-patients who are ready and willing to participate in uh, some of the training of our medical students. Um, and we'd like to uh, open this discussion, obviously, to our, um, our uh, I guess, our after, our discussion afterwards. Maybe we can come up with some new ideas and things, uh, some different things. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm Ryan Pryor. Again, I'll be uh, moderating the discussion between um, all the different panelists. And um, our first question comes from Twitter and the <clears throat> from Courage Sings. And it says, what about incorporating the patient voice through music? What can be learned through that specific medium? Yeah, I mean, that's um, all different kinds of um, visual, dramatic, and other kinds of art, I think, are really great venues for 
bringing in the patient voice. Um, patients are um, often incredibly creative in their strategies for dealing with their conditions. And there is uh, something really beautiful often happens when that creativity is also channeled into some form of artistic expression. And I, I think that you know, that's a great opportunity. And I've seen examples of that occur in different places. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? That Artwork is often used uh, with children to elicit what they're going through and what they're experiencing. So that's a good way to get the patient voice as well. We oftentimes forget that uh, children are patients as well. And uh, we, we sometimes forget that. Great. Um, and then any, do we have any questions from, from the audience? Here? And I'll be bringing the, the microphone back to you. Hi, thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, using point of view kind of exercises as a, as a method to generate empathy with patients, I think was the, the idea. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really curious, bringing education, patients into the educational experience is going to have a sort of, uh, there's going to be feedback or bounce back there, um, and it seems like a wonderful opportunity, or you met, might not, it might be an accident or opportunity, it's going to happen anyway, that patients will be educated about the medical system and, and stuff. And that's something that I think a lot of people in this class over the last few quarters have been talking about, like, mm -hmm. you know, patients are trying to educate themselves, or, you know, you guys all mentioned sort of this idea of, you know, patient networks and things like this, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if those uh, if there's any examples that you can give or might know of that you can send me to to, to learn more about um, bringing patients in to share their point of view, but then also having that exercise sort of provide them with a point of view that says, okay, whoa, okay, not that it's right or great or good, but wow, now I really understand why things are happening this way. And mm -hmm. it kind of, it, it helps everyone sort of F go somewhere together rather mm -hmm. than kind of just be like, okay, now I'm going to push you, now you push me. They mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. is there any, anyone doing this currently, like bringing patients in and sort of treating them as, for lack of a better word, like, you know, students themselves as well? I can't, I can't say that I know of anyone in particular that's doing that. Maybe someone in the audience knows or a program that's doing that in particular. Um, I think they're, they're, they, they probably exist. I'm not aware of them, but. But I want to say, I mean, I would, I would strongly encourage um, anyone to use, to use that exercise and have both parties do it because, I mean, for many, many reasons. For one, I do think it's really valuable for patients to understand um, what it's like to be a doctor because uh, it's hard to be a doctor. And doctors need empathy, too. And, and, and doctors need to be heard, and, and doctors need all of those same things as well. The doctor's voice has formally been part of medical education forever, but that doesn't mean that the doctor's voice is really present in medical education. So I would see an, a situation that did that kind of exercise, any of those exercises, in both directions as being extremely valuable for, for those very reasons. And also because, I mean, empathy has to work both ways. I mean. If one person empathizes with another, but the other person thinks that that person is something completely different, then you don't really get good communication there either. So, yeah. It, it, this uh, dovetails really well with a question, another question that we have on Twitter from, uh, also again from Courage Sings, and um, it says that what wh what can be done when there are patients who are ready to be included in the conversation, but their healthcare systems aren't ready? How can they help bring conversations with a reluctant system forward? It's kind of continue on that same train of thought, like how do we fix that? You guys could answer that question probably even better than <laughs> us as, as Z patients. Yeah, I think that a lot of uh, doctors are experiencing, they, they only have, you know, five or ten minutes to spend with, you know, per patient. And so there's, they've got to um, figure out ways to, you know, release the burden on, on the system. And, um, yeah, <laughs> that's not so good. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> sorry, I, I am... Still learning, so still. still oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. We have a question back here in the audience. So, with the advent of the uh, web, uh, there's a paradigm change in patient doctors' relationship. When patients has a lot, uh, uh, a lot of access to information and knowledge, well, doctors' time are constrained. So it's more like a uh, more collaborative uh, relationship between doctor and, 
and patience. Um, someone suggested the first uh, sessions about changing a patient's name yeah. to perhaps uh, CareMate. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm. I suppose in the future, uh, <clears throat> medical students are required to spend time <coughs> in social media and share the experience. And, uh, because that's yeah. where patients are uh, converging and discuss. Uh, they have a lot of time in uh, doing research and doing discourse on their own disease. Yeah, uh, I always like to say that I, I never really understood the patient experience, I mean, beyond being a patient myself, uh, until I followed patients 24-7 on Twitter, following someone like Brit and understanding what she goes through, um, or a dying breast cancer patient has been absolutely eye-opening for me. And I can't even remember what it was before I had that experience. I was completely isolated from those, uh, those experiences. Um, with re regarding the changing relationship, I have the unique position of having uh, started in medicine just before the web really came into being. And so um, seeing patients get the power of having information was absolutely fascinating at the beginning because it was intoxicating to them. And it was, I always felt like I had more antagonistic encounters with patients early on because patients didn't know how to use that power. Uh, but things, it's interesting, things have kind of evened out. And as I always like to say, patients have developed a more healthy relationship with that, with their information, like I show on that graph. And I get, I get less fighting with people, and they kind of see what my role is and what the role of the information is. And we sort of all live in a happy ecosystem. So it's been an interesting process to see it all play out. And I feel really privileged to be born at this point in history. But um, all good points. Um, the next question comes from Twitter, and it kind of uh, goes well with this last one. That, uh, from Afternoon Napper, what would providers like to learn from patients, uh, real patients, about living with a chronic disease? So let's talk about Britt Johnson. What, what were some specific things that you learned from Britt Johnson that opened your eyes? What that well, just, like? you know, um, it, it, it kind of fits into what we call ambient monitoring in, in, in the social world, okay? I, I screen, my, screen my feed, and I frequently see what Britt's going through with regard to her pain or how she's propping her pillows or what her husband's doing for her or the strain that she feels with her husband by feeling sometimes she's imposing on him. So there's a lot of elements to it, a lot of layers that I, that I pick up just with that and I follow a number of e-patients. Um, and again, it's, it's a subtle background thing. It's not really something specific necessarily. Right. I don't know if that answers the question. Right, yeah, because it's, it's, it's what they live with 24-7. So it's like, you know, anything that right. they're, not, they're posting about what they're doing that day, it, that is the patient experience. You can't turn it on and turn it off. And I don't think we, le we leverage that patient conversation with the medical students, like Amol said in that tweet, that he's studying pathophysiology. What a great opportunity to create, I mean, some sort of specific means of, or list of patients to follow, or even if it's just temporary. Um, and I don't think we do that enough. Yeah, I want to just say, I think, um, I'm not sure that that many uh, providers who are not already engaged in this kind of social communication uh, know what questions to ask in the sense that there, I mean, there's a kind of paradigm shift that has to take place where it's like from the old model that Brian was talking about where listening doesn't really occur to a new model where you do learn all these kinds of details about the very, the subtle intricacies of someone's daily life, which are not at all on the table in terms of the standard teaching for like how you communicate with a patient. So there's like such a huge gulf between those things that it's almost like a switch has to be flipped. And once you turn it on, and you just have to listen, actually. You just have to listen for a while and see yeah. that those are the details, and then you can start to kind of form more specific kinds of questions, do you think? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see if we have a um, question from the audience. I'm wondering if there are, um, I, I would say, I guess, ecosystem challenges to um, practitioners being able to access good digital tools. Um, I mean, as you mentioned, Brian, like, you already have a glut of journals piling up, right. you know, in which somebody has kind of already done the work for you of sorting what, right. what's publishable, what's worthy. Yeah. Um, how do you go and find those digital tools for storytelling that enrich your perspective? <coughs> well, 
on the story, storytelling issue, maybe that would be something you could address, or is that? I mean, you know, I would two things. I would just say briefly. Um, I mean, w yes. So this is this is a scenario that I presented. That's um, when you have the luxury of time, like when you're in training and you find a way to carve out space in the training context to do stuff like this with the goal of bringing those skills with you later. Later, when you don't have time to do that kind of thing, um, use the tools that you have. Your smartphone has, you know, most of them on it, right? In in some way or other. But also. Um, I mean, the, we're kind of on the cusp of a transformation, this is my optimistic view, a transformation of the electronic medical record or the electronic health record, right? Project Open Notes opened the opened electronic health records to patients instead of just to doctors. And this has been an ongoing experiment that has been successful. Why couldn't those platforms also include some of the kinds of representations that I was talking about so that there is at least a space for them to be part of the health record. Now, will a practicing clinician go and kind of peruse those things on a regular basis? Maybe not, but will they be available for dialogue in a clinical encounter when needed, perhaps? So that's kind of how I think about it. I don't want to encourage um, clinicians to try to develop a whole elaborate set of tools on top of what they use that m might not um, fit into their workflow. I think the ultimate goal is figuring out how to do this in the context that you're already working in. Yeah, and I'll just add to that a little bit that um, with our patient population, the MECFS, that you know, patients will have the experience of giving their, in literally handing a journal article to a doctor during a doctor's visit and the and doctor just sort of disregards it. And so one of the hopes, you know, one of, uh, part of our experiment at least is when, as we accredit our documentary for uh, continuing medical education credit, will that be more interesting or more useful to a doctor than reading a journal article? Will that make it come away in a, a new way? Because you can't incorporate the patient experience into the um, medical journal article per se, but perhaps if we mix it up a little bit and do continue my medical education via a documentary vehicle instead, that you know, we'll, I know, we'll, we'll find out once we do it. Um, yeah, Any, who, there was a few questions from the audience. I know. One thing I was thinking about as you guys were discussing <coughs> um, medical education and painting the picture for medical students is when I was a medical student, we had the opportunity to talk to patient one time about the disease. Right. And that was it. And so that patient was had a very, they were very well educated about their story. They came every year. They, they were very educated about the disease, but we only got to see them 15 minutes for one point, one interval in their disease experience. And so I think that there's definitely value in bringing that patient back. Um, some of them may not physically be able to come to the class, but we have all these social media you know, channels, right. we can YouTube their experience, we can encourage them to, you know, um, promote their experience at one of some of the more, most inconvenient, painful, uncomfortable moments so that they can paint the picture, whether it's through audio, visual, whatever it is, I think that video can capture so many things that we really can't appreciate when those patients come in for that one small interval. And beyond the ambient monitoring that I talked about, there's also a whole host of, um, there's a whole variety of blogs and other types of media that patients are creating on a variety of different levels that really create a teaching opportunity, I think, for students if they were leveraged in just the right way. And it's 24-7, and you don't need a patient to come into an amphitheater. Yeah, and I just love that tweet that you, sh that you guys shared that um, the, the, the medical student saying that, you know, yeah. seeing it on, on Twitter, humanize it for you. So it's a, it's a great study tool. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's one more question in the audience. Does anybody else have um, something they want to add? Right. Thanks. Question about, um, as a medical professional, um, are there, do you see flaws in the tools that, are peop that people are using to gather their medical information that leads them to be you know, misinformed or confused? Um, and if so, how would you kind of instruct the technologists developing these tools in, um, you know, what, what uh, types of features should be available to patients who are looking for information in the very large pool of, of data? 
you say flaws in terms of collecting um, what kind of information? Like, so, so the patients are going, I don't know if it's a, a Google search or they're using WebMD or something, and I would imagine yeah. that there's a lot of flaws in how these searches are carried out that lead right. patients to get information they're not able to understand or too much information. Yeah, online, certainly online health literacy is one of the biggest problems that we face. I was talking all rosy about Google here, but um, really there are a lot of issues that we face in training our physician, uh, training our patients rather, or even training physicians how to be literate with in the online space is a huge challenge. Um, I know that in my own practice with uh, parents that I see, I know that um, children with eosinophilic gastroenteritis, uh, the parents are going to search for eosinophils and we know they're going to see a lot about parasites and so I always exercise what I call preemptive online literacy. I tell them what they're going to find and what might not uh, um, be accurate. Um, the other thing we can do proactively is to prescribe uh, prescribe links and prescribe resources for patients that um, uh, we can we can offer to them so that we we sort of vet those and curate them. Curation is probably one of the most important things that we're going to see going forward that we can do as physicians, pulling together information of all the information that's out there, pulling together the best for our patients. Great. And I think that that'll do it. Uh, so thank you to our panelists for coming thank you. And, and very informative discussion. And thank you for all the students for coming and thank you for everybody to for tuning in online. Um, and can you, uh, talk with us on Twitter. Thank you. If you like what you see in this class, be sure to check out our online course, Engage and Empower Me, a new online class from the Stanford University School of Medicine. We are featuring presentations from patients and experts on participatory medicine. Through this course, we hope to empower you to take part in creating a more inclusive and collaborative healthcare system. The course can be found at class.stanford.edu. As a reminder, this program is made possible by support from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. If you haven't yet done so, please take a moment to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX so you can continue the conversation online and stay informed of program updates. From all of us here at Stanford Medicine X, we want to thank you for joining us today and remind you to join us again next Thursday, October 16th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for another edition of Stanford Medicine X Live, featuring a new class on medical education from the Stanford University School of Medicine called Medical Education in the New Millennium. Next week, we are going to feature Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education at Stanford, Dr. Charles Prober. For all of you out there taking time to tune in with us tonight, thank you for joining us and being part of the conversation. A special thanks to our guest panelists this evening. From all of us at Stanford Medicine X, we'll see you next time.